Good evening. I'm Alexander Rosen, the executive director at the Long Now Foundation. Thank you all for making it out tonight and squeezing in. Looks like uh, I think we let everybody in from the outside line. Thank you. Um, as many of you know that before we do these talks, we have a tradition called the long short, a short film that exemplifies long-term thinking. We try and uh, theme these for the evening's talk. And uh, for this evening, uh, Austin in our office found this wonderful one that was done for a Radio Lab episode uh, called Words. And it is about the interpretation of words. And it has no words in it. Enjoy. Here, Mr. Back is coming off the corner here at the end is pension. Play ball! Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. Long Now was surprised by getting interested in languages. Our Rosetta project really was just an idea to figure out something that would be fun to show in a uh, non-digital preservation format. But once we discovered that nobody had actually collected all of the documented languages in the world in one place, we started to get into it. And now the person in charge of Rosetta is Laura Welcher, a linguist by training, and uh, we are finding ourselves keep getting involved with, with language. So we had Dan Everett up here uh, a couple of months ago, uh, who had spent time with the Paraha and the Amazon, and uh, he threw out Noam Chomsky's approach to linguistics because it didn't fit with what he saw in the field. Our next speaker says that all anthropologists have this experience. Please welcome someone coming from psychology to linguistics, Lara Boroditsky.
Thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak to this uh, crowd, the, the, home, uh, the home crowd. Um, I study how the languages that we speak shape the way we think. And all uh, discussion of this question starts with the basic uh, observation that languages really differ from one another in what they require of their speakers. So let's start with a hypothetical example. Uh, suppose you want to say this. You know it's hypothetical. Right? Um, let's just focus on the verb. Um, if you were to say this in English, uh, and this is something that happened in the past, then you have to mark that on the verb. So you have to say read instead of will read or reads or is reading and so on. So you have to include information about tense. Now, in some languages, you wouldn't change the verb. In fact, you couldn't change the verb to mark tense. So in Indonesian, for example, uh, the verb would always stay the same. In some languages, not only would you have to change the verb to mark tense, but you'd have to figure out how long ago in the past the event happened. So for example, in Mian, uh, Papua New Guinean language, there are five different past tenses. So depending on whether something happened just now or within the last two weeks or within a month or within a year and so on, uh, you would have to use a different past tense. In some languages, uh, like in Russian, my native language, you'd have to mark tense, but you'd also have to include on the verb the gender of the reader. So if it was Todd Palin that did the reading, you'd use a different form of the verb than if it was Sarah. In Russian also, uh, you have to change the verb depending on whether the event was completed or not in some sense. So if uh, Sarah read the whole thing from cover to cover assiduously, that would be one form of the verb. But if she skimmed it or uh, if she just started it and put it down, that would be a different form of the verb. In Russian, you also have to do this in the future tense, which is very inconvenient when you're making your say to someone, oh, I'll read your thesis tomorrow. You really have to commit to whether you're going to read the whole thing. <laughs> um, in some languages, like in Turkish, you have to change the verb depending on how you came to know about this information. So if uh, you witness this miraculous event with your own eyes, that would be one form of the verb. But if you just heard about it uh, from someone, or maybe it's something you inferred from something that she said, that would be a different form of the verb. And again, some languages make many such distinctions that um, if you know something from hearing as opposed to from sight, as opposed to inferring it from hearing, as opposed to inferring it from sight, you'd use uh, all these different forms of the verb. So on the one hand, when people have looked at such differences, they've said, wow, languages really require very different things of their speakers. It must be the case that speakers of different languages see the world differently. Just in order to be able to speak the language grammatically, they have to pay attention to very different things. On the other s side, people have argued, you know, not so fast. Just because people talk differently doesn't necessarily mean that they think differently. Maybe everyone notices all of these different things, and just depending on the language that you speak, you happen to include one bit of information or another bit of information, but it doesn't really mean that you don't know all the other stuff. Yeah. Linguistic expressions are always very sparse. We only, we all, we're only ever saying a very small proportion of what we actually know, so it could be that everyone actually knows and pays attention to all this stuff. Logically, that would mean that all speakers of all languages would have to pay attention to and encode all of the distinctions that are encoded in all of the world's languages. And that's a big, potentially very big set of stuff, but it's not impossible. So that's the debate. Um, and the question of whether language shapes thought is not really just one question. It's lots of interesting questions that we could ask. For example, you could ask, do people who speak different languages think differently? Does learning new languages shape the way you think? So if you take a French class or a Japanese class, are you just learning a new way of talking? Or are you actually learning a new way of thinking, a new way of uh, seeing the world? Do polyglots, people who speak lots of languages, do they think differently depending on the language that they're speaking uh, in the moment? Um, some people, some bilinguals report that they're actually, they feel like they're different people. So they say, when I'm speaking Spanish, I feel like I have a different personality, like I'm a different person than when I'm speaking English. Are some thoughts unthinkable without language? If your language doesn't have a particular property or if you haven't learned that particular property yet, uh, would, are there some things that are impossible for you to conceive? And ultimately, what is basic, what is universal in human cognition 
how do languages and cultures allow us to become as smart and as sophisticated as we are? And is there intrinsic value in all this linguistic diversity? There are about 7,000 languages in the world, and they all differ from one another in innumerable ways. Is there value in that? Okay. Now, people have been expressing opinions on this topic for a very, very long time. So uh, here, for example, Charlemagne, Holy Roman Emperor, he says, uh, to have a second language is to have a second soul. That's a very strong statement about uh, the value of a language. One of his successors says, a man who knows four languages is, fourth, is worth four men. Again, another very strong statement. Uh, another successor, Frederick the Great of Prussia, had a more specific set of hypotheses. He says, I speak English to my accountants, um, French to my ambassadors, Italian to my mistress, Latin to my god, and German to my horse. <laughs> Not sure how he came up with this particular set. But these are the kinds of things that people have been positing for a long time. Uh, maybe German is better for reason, or maybe French is better for love, or maybe Hebrew is better for oratory. There isn't any empirical evidence for any of these huge overarching hypotheses. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about more specific hypotheses. Now, uh, of course, these guys had a lot of clout. <laughs> not, not everyone has been in love with this idea. So here uh, is Jerry Fodor. He's a, a philosopher of mind. And uh, he says, I hate relativism more than I hate anything else, excepting maybe fiberglass powerboats. He's a sailor, so he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't like uh, all the noise and wake of those boats. Uh, but beyond those boats, uh, the real bane of his existence is this idea that language might shape the way people think. And his view really expresses what cognitive science and philosophy of mind and linguistics had come around to over the last uh, uh, few decades. People really became disenchanted with this idea that language might shape the way we think, and partially because there is so little evidence of uh, these kinds of effects. So what I want to do today is show you some of the uh, new evidence that we have. OK, so the question we have is, do the structures of particular languages uh, shape the way we attend to, encode, represent, remember, and reason about the world? OK, and uh, here's the outline for the talk. Um, I'll talk about f roughly four different ways that language can shape thought. These are four ways that I think are interesting. Uh, the first one is whether language can have deep or early effects on cognition. The next one is whether language can have broad or pervasive effects. I'll, I'll explain these uh, later. Whether there are big differences as a function of cross-linguistic uh, differences. And whether there are important real-world consequences. So start, let's start with deep early effects. What do I mean by this? What I mean is there are some um, cross-linguistic differences that uh, can change how you perceive the world. So uh, even the very basics of perceptual processing, things, processes that are very, very early in the cognitive stream, uh, might be affected by language. Now, if you can show that something like that takes place, that means um, that everything down, downstream, everything past that early perceptual process will be affected as well. And that's very exciting, right? Because um, we're getting a huge amount of information from the world, and we can't possibly process all of it. So we have to throw a lot of information away. And so if it's the case that speakers of different languages are throwing out different parts of their perceptual information, once you throw out information early on in the perceptual processing stream, it's gone. You can't get it back. So uh, that's one reason that people have been very excited to look for early effects in cognition. And one classic uh, domain to look is in the perception of color. So languages divide up the color spectrum in many, many different ways. Some languages have only two words for color. Some have uh, lots and lots of words. Um, and here's an example. These colors don't look uh, exactly right, but just take my word for it. Um, so in English, uh, there's a category blue that covers, let's pretend, all of the colors on the screen that are here. But in Russian, there isn't a single word for blue. Uh, there are instead two different words. You have to make a distinction between light blues, голубой, and dark blues, sini. So that means that Russian speakers have to call these two colors by different names. Does that mean that Russian speakers actually see those colors as being more different from one another? Would it be easier for them to distinguish these two colors? So here's a really simple task. People uh, are shown three patches of color. 
uh, the color on top is identical to one of the colors on the bottom. Can you all tell which one? The, the left, right? And so uh, in the task, that's all you'd have to do, is you'd have to press a button either on the left or on the right to say which one is identical. Very simple task. You don't have to be very smart to do this task. Uh, if you were a pigeon, you could do this task, right? This is, uh, so you don't need language for this task. And the question is, does, does the fact that you make a distinction in your language actually change how quickly and uh, how well you can do this task? So the task is set up this way. On some trials, the distractor color, the color that you're not going to choose, comes from uh, a different linguistic category in Russian uh, than the two colors that are identical. And on other trials, it comes from the same linguistic category. So for a Russian speaker, this kind of trial uh, on your left should be easier than the trial on the right. For an English speaker, of course, they're all blue. right? There's no distinction. So both kinds of trials should be equally, um, equally fast. Uh, of course, the words never appear on the colors. They're just there for your, uh, your convenience. Now, uh, when we started doing this uh, study, we did it because I thought it wasn't going to work. And I, I thought it would be a really good way to place some limits on how far language can reach into the cognitive system. But there were two surprises coming my way. The first surprise is there's actually a difference between Russian and English speakers in how they were able to do this task. Russian speakers were faster on these kinds of trials than on these kinds of trials, whereas English speakers showed no difference. Even though they were looking at all the same colors that the Russian speakers were looking at, there's nothing in the nature of the colors that was different. They uh, actually were uh, performing the task differently. The second surprise was that when we took people's ability to uh, use language in the task away, so as people were doing this task, we made them uh, repeat numbers to themselves. This uh, kind of wipes out your ability to, uh, to uh, access your linguistic knowledge fluently. When we did that, that took away the cross-linguistic difference. Now Russian speakers and English speakers look the same. Now that suggested to us that it was really language meddling in this very low-level perceptual task that we never would have thought language would be reaching into. And that, that was a big surprise. So uh, that suggests that language can actually uh, reach in into these very early uh, perceptual processes and change how we, uh, how we process even the perceptual world. OK, so that's color. What about uh, something more broad, something, um, uh, something that uh, applies to maybe more, uh, more different categories in the world? And here, here's an example. Uh, the broader pervasive uh, kinds of effects usually come from grammatical differences. So, uh, in lots of languages, there are grammatical gender systems where all nouns are assigned into uh, one gender or another, so masculine or feminine, for example, in Spanish. Uh, how many people here speak a language of grammatical genders, just so I have a sense? OK, so I'll, almost all of you know what I'm talking about. OK, and it can be really frustrating. You know you can, it can be really frustrating to learn a language with grammatical gender. David Sedaris has this wonderful uh, essay about how he was frustrated by learning French uh, grammatical gender so much so that he decided to refer to everything in the plural. So he would get two toasters and two tomatoes and uh, two blenders and, uh, because then he wouldn't have to remember the grammatical genders of anything. Um, so uh, one thing that's very convenient about, uh, about grammatical genders is they differ from language to language. So for example, the word for the sun is feminine in German, masculine in Spanish. The word for the moon is masculine in German, feminine in Spanish. Does that mean that people actually German speakers actually think of the sun as being more feminine somehow, whereas Spanish speakers think of it as being more masculine? Could people actually take meaning from these grammatical genders? Um, let me just show you an example of how pervasive grammatical gender marking can be in a language that has a grammatical gender. So this is an example from Russian. So in Russian, words that have different grammatical genders have different phonological properties. They'll sound different. Um, you use different number words. So the word for one will be different depending on on whether it's one masculine something or feminine something. Uh, you get different adjective endings, different pronouns and possessives, and even different verb endings. So uh, circled in red there is one example. If you want to say in Russian, my chair was white, the word for chair is masculine. So you use the masculine form of my, then you have the word chair, which is, has a masculine sound. 
Then you use the masculine form of was and uh, the masculine form of white. So you've just marked the masculinity of a chair four times in four words. You don't have a lot of opportunity to forget what grammatical gender things are in Russian. A very pervasive feature of language. Now, what would an effect of grammatical gender actually look like? What does it mean um, if I say to you, do you think of a chair as masculine or feminine? Clearly, you're not thinking it has you know, biological properties that are masculine or feminine. What, what could it possibly mean? So here's an example. Uh, this is uh, Andrei Makin describing uh, an experience that he had as he was switching between Russian and, uh, and French, uh, spending summers uh, with his grandmother. He says, as a child, I had absorbed all the sounds of Charlotte's language, French. I swam in them without wondering why that glint in the grass, that colored, scented, living brilliance, sometimes existed in the masculine and had a crunchy, fragile, crystalline identity imposed, it seemed, by one of its names, Sutok. That's the Russian word for uh, flower, and it's uh, masculine. And was sometimes enveloped in a velvety, felt-like, and feminine aura, becoming une fleur, which is French uh, for flower and is feminine. So that's the kind of effect of grammatical gender on semantics that we're looking for, uh, that something takes on a different kind, a different shape, uh, a different shading, a different connotation depending on the grammatical features that it has in a language. Now, do normal people have these kinds of associations or just sensitive young men learning French from their grandmothers? Uh, so here are some examples uh, from the empirical literature, people, people who are not poets uh, showing this kind of effect. Um, Russian speakers, this is a study done in 1915, an old study, uh, Russian speakers at Moscow State University were asked to personify days of the week, so act like Monday or act like Wednesday or act like Tuesday. Now these days of the week have different grammatical genders, so Monday is uh, masculine but Wednesday is feminine. And uh, what the researchers noticed, this is a study by Roman Jakobson, what he noticed was people were acting out as if these days of the week actually had genders. They would act like a man for Monday, but like a woman for Wednesday. In another study, uh, young kids, Spanish-speaking kids were asked, we're making an animated movie, and here are all the characters, and there might have been a clock, and there might have been a fox, and there might have been a pencil or something like that. What voices should we give to these characters? And they had to choose voices. And uh, even very young kids were uh, starting to pick voices that were congruent with grammatical gender. So the voice they wanted a clock to have depended on the grammatical gender in their language. Um, in another set of studies, people were asked to describe objects. So you just come into the lab and you, you're told, give me three adjectives that describe a bridge. And people have to uh, give you some adjectives. And the kinds of adjectives people came up with, again, were congruent with grammatical gender. So if you uh, if it's feminine in your language, you're more likely to say beautiful or elegant or extended, whereas if it's masculine in your language, you're more likely to say things like long and towering and big, enormous. Um, and uh, you can even see these effects with your own eyes if you go to an art gallery and ask, how do artists decide how to personify abstract entities in their art? Um, so we did this. We looked through... Uh, Art Store, which is a uh, giant art database, about 600 years of artworks uh, that we concentrated on. And we asked, for all the personifications that exist in this art database, can we predict whether time or death or victory will be masculine or feminine, depending on the grammatical gender in the artist's native language? The answer is 78% of the time we can make a prediction. So you know, if you want to make a bet, it's a pretty good uh, bet to, uh, to place. And these are the kinds of things you can see for yourself. So for example, the Statue of Liberty. Right? Why is Liberty a lady? Well, she's French. Uh, she comes. Uh, and in French, Liberty is feminine. Or here you see John Ashcroft, uh, and behind him is the Statue of Justice that he tried to cover up because she was so indecent. And uh, again, you could ask, why is Justice a woman? Well, uh, Justice is feminine in Latin. That's where, that's where it comes from. Uh, here are some of my favorite examples. This is Michelangelo uh, sculpting different parts of the day. So the dawn, uh, the day, the dusk, and the night. Um, and you might ask, well, why is the dawn uh, a woman and the day a man and the dusk uh, a man and the night a woman? Well, uh, those are the grammatical genders in Italian. Right? Uh, 
this is a wonderful way in which this little quirk of grammar that we don't even, you know, when you speak a language like this uh, as a native speaker, you don't even notice, but it, it's making its way even into the physical world that we, uh, that we then uh, live in, right? And it gets passed down in these physical ideas that other, other people inherit. Okay, now one reason to be interested in this funny quirk of grammatical gender is that the grammatical gender is so pervasive in uh, language. Gender goes on all nouns. So um, if you can show that grammatical gender affects how people think, that means that this is a feature of language that is affecting how people think about anything that can be named by a noun. Now think about what are all the things that can be named by nouns. It's a lot of stuff, right? Uh, as you look around the world, uh, that's a very, very pervasive effect of language. Okay, are there big differences? So grammatical gender, maybe these are small alternations, widely spread, but are there any really big differences? Um, for the big differences, I think we need to turn to uh, those parts of cognition where we really need to construct the world where the world doesn't have the structure to give to us, we have to bring the structure to it. And one really good place to look for that are abstract ideas. So uh, take time. Time is one of my favorite examples because uh, it's, on the one hand, it's extremely popular. So the word time is uh, the most frequent noun in English and other temporal words like year and day are also in the top 10. At least in English speaking culture, we're obsessed with time. Uh, but even though it's so frequent, it's, uh, it's hard to get your hands on, right? It's, it forms the very fabric of our experience, but you can't see it time, you can't touch time, you can't smell time. How don't we come up with a mental representation of this abstract entity? Um, now, this idea, this question of how do you come up with mental representations of abstract things has been haunting people for a really long time. Uh, it frustrated Plato, for example. It frustrated him so much that he came up with a very famous philosophical argument. It's called an argument from the poverty of the stimulus. What that argument was is that information available in the environment is simply not enough, not structured enough, not complex enough, not available enough to be able to create abstract thought. And so uh, he says, I can't see how we could possibly learn these things. And so his solution is, um, we recall them from past incarnations of our souls. Uh, now you may think, okay, uh, you know, what, that's Plato, that's a long time ago. Uh, what did the Greeks know anyway? Right? Aristotle thought the brain was a radiator. So uh, they didn't even know thinking happened in the brain. Why, why should we care? Well, actually, quite modern uh, ideas about where uh, concepts come from uh, share some of these very properties. So here, for example, is Noam Chomsky from 2000. He says, even words such as carburetor and bureaucrat, in fact, pose the familiar problem of poverty of the stimulus. However surprising the conclusion may be that nature has provided us with an innate stock of concepts and that the child's task is to discover their labels, there appear to be few other possibilities. Now, um, I'd like to think that there must be another possibility. Not, I, this is a very, wouldn't it be really exciting, though, if you actually were born with the idea of carburetor or bureaucrat already in your mind? That would be awesome, right? But given that I don't know what a carburetor is now, that seems <laughs> unlikely. So let's, uh, let's look for some other answers. So what would be another answer? Um, well, here's a story. How do we come up with an idea like time travel? That's a fancy notion that we have. Um, it's probably not through personal experience through time travel, right? It's not because you actually went and traveled to another time and came back and you stored away that experience. Um, but here's a story. Um, across languages, people use spatial language, spatial words to talk about time. So we say things like, we're approaching the holidays, we're coming up on Christmas, uh, we're um, coming up to the deadline, and so on. Now, that metaphor lays out a, met a metaphor, an analogy, where time is a path and you're traveling on it, right? Well, once you have that analogy in place, so time is a path and you're traveling on it, well, on a regular path, you can travel in any direction you want and whatever speed you want. So once you have that analogy in place, it allows the possibility of time travel. You can now create that idea very easily. 
So what's, what kind of evidence could we have that this kind of way of building knowledge actually is possible or something that people do? Uh, well, so one question you could ask, is it the case that people build knowledge of time out of knowledge of space? And the other is, do patterns in language and culture actually encourage how people, uh, encourage different ways of using space for thinking about time? Those are the two ingredients of the time travel story I just gave you. One is you have to have patterns in language that encourage an analogy, and the other is that you are reusing spatial knowledge somehow to think about time. Well, let me give you just a, a couple of brief data points. I'm going to pick the coolest ones that I, that I have, um, but if you have uh, more detailed questions, I'd love to hear them. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> one way, um, this is a good uh, demonstration of how uh, I stay oriented. Um, one way to test the idea that the way people think about time is based on how they think about space is to find cultures that have diff different ways of thinking about space and see if they also have different ways of thinking about time. So to demonstrate the difference, why don't we all do this one thing? Why don't I'm going to ask all of you to close your eyes. And I can sort of see you, so I can tell whether or not you've closed your eyes. OK, now everyone point southeast. Okay, no, no cheating. Okay, you can open your eyes. I see points there, 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 there. I don't know which way it is. You guys are going to have to figure it out later. Um, let me make a few observations about what you did as a cognitive psychologist. Uh, first, uh, there's a really low compliance rate. A lot of you just did not point. <laughs> We would, we would have to throw you out of the subject pool. Um, second, there is a, a really long reaction time. For a lot of you, it took a long time to, to point. And uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, the accuracy wasn't very high. Now, I don't need to know which way it is to know that, because you guys pointed in every possible direction. Uh, now, there are some places where asking a question like that uh, would yield immediate correct responses from everyone, including people who are five years old. Right. So uh, don't feel bad. Uh, you know, when I ask folks at Stanford or Harvard or MIT, uh, they do exactly the same thing that you guys did. It's just not something that we keep track of. Uh, so what are these cultures that keep track of where they are all the time? So here's an example of a culture I had a chance to work with. These are the Kuktaior. They're an Aboriginal group in Australia. Um, and What's cool about their language is they don't use uh, words like left and right to divide up space. Instead, everything is expressed in terms of north, south, east, and west. And by everything, I mean everything at all scales. So you say things like, there's a dog trying to bite your east leg. Uh, can you move your cup to the north, northwest a little bit? The boy standing south of Mary is my brother. Uh, at every scale. In order to speak a language like this, you must stay oriented, because you don't just have to stay oriented to describe your experiences in the moment. You have to remember also which way you're oriented to be able to describe any past experiences, right? So you have to uh, be able to say things like, oh, I must have left my glasses to the northwest of the telephone. How silly of me, right? Or after a dinner party, you come home and you say, oh, they set their salad forks to the southeast of the dinner forks, the Philistines, right? <laughs> so. Um, even, to, even to say hello, so the way you say hello in Kuk Tayor is, um, in English we say, how are you? Fine. In Kuk Tayor you say, which way are you going? And the answer should be something like, north, northeast in the far distance, how about you? Right. Uh, that is literally to get past hello you have to know which way you're going. So imagine in your normal daily lives, as you're walking around your office or you're walking around uh, wherever it is you are, every person who says hi to you, you have to report your heading direction. Right? <laughs> you'd get oriented pretty quick. Right? Otherwise, you'd be excluded out of all social interactions, because you couldn't say hello to people properly. Um, so uh, people who speak languages like this, there are a lot of languages like this around the world. People who speak languages like this do have a great sense of direction. They are able to perform feats of navigation that we used to think were beyond human ability. So um, we knew for a long time that animals, different kinds of animals, had uh, 
orientation abilities that seem to surpass human orientation abilities. So for example, uh, we'd say, oh, ants, uh, they stay oriented pretty well, they can debt reckon, but they use a trick, they count steps, so it doesn't count. Uh, or birds, you know, they stay oriented, but they have magnets in their beaks, so, you know, <laughs> it takes us off the hook. Well, turns out there are people in the world who just stay oriented by paying attention to where they're going at all times because they have to in order to be able to speak their language grammatically. Right? So we don't have any excuses. Uh, you don't need to have a ma magnets in your beaks uh, to do it. Uh, and th this great sense of direction is seen in all kinds of cultural practices in art. So uh, the art that people produce in these cultures is always done from a bird's eye view. It's laid out on the ground in the appropriate orientation uh, and so on. So what I wanted to find out is, remember we're thinking about how people think about time. And the question is, if you think about space differently, do you, does that also mean you think about other things differently? Like, do you also think about time differently? So here's a task. I give people a set of pictures like this. These happen to be pictures of my grandfather at different ages. I scramble them up, I give them to you, and I say, lay these out on the ground so that they're in the correct order. Well, here they're displayed in the correct order as, uh, as English speakers perceive the correct order from left to right. That's the way time goes for us. Uh, now, of course, this left to right order relates to writing direction, right? There's nothing intrinsically left to right about time. Um, and uh, there are wonderful examples from the history of advertising where uh, Nestle, for example, have uh, this logo. This is part of their nutritional supplement for kids program. And whenever they uh, tried this out in, say, an Arabic-speaking country, they ran into some problems. Because if you read this from uh, right to left, <laughs> it's not clear what this product does for your child. Um, <laughs> so they had, to, they had to rethink their approach. And indeed, when people are asked to lay out uh, th things in temporal order, English speakers will lay things out like this, whereas Hebrew speakers will go in the other direction. Right? And there's even a, a really fun finding where uh, for any sentence you ask people, imagine Bill is giving flowers to Susie. Draw that out. Uh, well, English speakers will draw that out with Bill on the left and Susie on the right. But Arabic speakers will draw it out with Bill on the right and Susie on the left. So why is it that when we imagine an action, it seems to go in the direction of writing? It's kind of a cool, uh, cool finding that all the actions that you imagine have this uh, perceptual order to them. OK, so back to time. Uh, the cook tayor don't use words like left and right. So how will they arrange time? English speakers do it from left to right, Hebrew from right to left. What will they do? Here's a, uh, an example person. Uh, sorry for my messy field notes here. Um, so here's a person, they're si uh, seated facing south. And these numbers represent the temporal order. And these are a bunch of different picture sets that they laid out. So here, everything goes from uh, left to right. Uh, here's uh, the same person on a different day, this time they're facing north, and now everything goes from right to left. Here's another person, they're facing east, and now everything comes towards them. What's the order? The sun from east to west, right? Now, uh, at first, when you look at this pattern, you, could, you might think, wow, there's no order. They're just doing it any which way. They don't care if it's left to right, right to left, or whatever. Uh, but actually, Another way to put it is that it's the English speakers that are doing it with no order. Right? Why do we think that time always travels with us? Right? With respect to my body orientation in the moment, time is going this way, but now it's going this way, but now it's going this way. <laughs> Very egocentric of us, right? Uh, time has to turn around every time I turn around. Uh, for them, time stays uh, with respect to the landscape, perhaps as it should. Okay. Now, one reason to be interested in these kinds of examples is that they demonstrate a really big difference in uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive ability between two cultures. Um, most of the English speakers that we tested on these tasks could not have done what the Kuktaiar did because they simply didn't know which way it was which. So even if they wanted to um, lay out time from east to west, they had no idea which way east and west were, so they couldn't do it. Um, and those who did know uh, which way east and west were would never have thought to do it this way. It's just not the way we organize our world. We organize it with respect to us as opposed to with respect to the landscape. 
And I think this shows that there are some cross-linguistic differences that are not just a matter of degree, that one group does it more or less this way or another way. They're just qualitatively different ways of organizing the world that people have. And that, for me, this is the very exciting thing, is discovering these other ways that you could organize the world, other ways that you could see the world. It's right there. Uh, and it's almost like you get to inhabit another universe, another parallel universe, just by discovering a different way of seeing the world. OK, so we've been talking about how people think about time. And I've given you two examples so far uh, of um, what makes a difference in how people think about time. One is how people think about space. So if you find groups that think about space differently, they'll think about time differently. But uh, the other one was about cultural artifacts like writing direction. That also seems to matter. Uh, what about patterns in language, metaphors in language for time? Let me give you a few examples uh, from here. Um, is time horizontal or is it vertical? Well, uh, here's a study comparing English and Mandarin speakers. In both English and Mandarin, you can use horizontal terms to organize time. But uh, in Mandarin, uh, vertical terms are also quite frequent. So in Mandarin, the past is up and the future is down. So the up month is the last month, and the down month is the next month. So um, does that mean that Mandarin speakers actually think about time vertically more, more so than English speakers do? So here's a simple task. Uh, stand next to someone, and you say, if I tell you that this here is today, where would you put yesterday, and where would you put tomorrow? person just has to point. So let me show you an example. This is a dr dramatic reenactment. What month is this? This is May. Suppose I said this is May. Where would you put April? Mm -hmm. And where would you put June? Excellent. And here's a, another Mandarin speaker. Is so if I were to tell you that lunch is right here, mm -hmm. where would you say that breakfast is? Here. Right there? Mm. And where would you say that dinner is? Dinner may be here. Okay. So let me show you another, another way to test this that's a, a little bit more implicit. Uh, this is a task you can, you can try for yourself. So uh, you're going to see a picture like this. Um, and then you're going to see another picture that will represent either an earlier or later time point. So uh, starting from this, is it earlier or later? Later. Very good. Good. All right. OK. <laughs> yeah, some of these are tricky. OK. Now, uh, instead of responding verbally, as I was just asking you to do, we asked our participants to respond by pressing buttons. And the buttons could have been arranged like this, where the earlier button's on the left and the later button's on the right. Or they could have been reversed um, uh, in the opposite direction from what English speakers like. Uh, or they could have been arranged vertically, either with the earlier button on top or with the earlier button on the bottom. And the question was, Will there be some mapping that's more natural that uh, English and Mandarin speakers like better than others? Uh, I feel like we know each other well enough. I can show you a graph. Uh, it's a, it's the first graph of the talk. Um, so uh, on the y-axis is reaction time. So up is slower. Uh, and here we have English speakers on, on the left. And English speakers, indeed, are considerably faster when uh, the earlier button is on the left than when it's on the right. They don't like it when the earlier button's on the right. But when the buttons are, are arranged vertically, they don't care. They don't care if the earlier button is on top or on the bottom. Uh, for the Mandarin speakers, uh, they also prefer the earlier button on the left to on the right. But unlike the English speakers, they also have a preference on the vertical axis. They want the earlier button to be on top. Past, uh, earlier past is up. Uh, they don't want the earlier bot button to be on the bottom. And let me just point out that there is an overall difference. The Mandarin speakers uh, in our sample are a little bit slower than the English speakers. And that's just because this, the, our English speakers are always Stanford students, right? So they're selected to be able to perform arbitra arbitrary tasks very, very efficiently. Uh, it's very hard to find other people who are equally selected for especially this purpose. Um, so that's why there, there's always going to be a difference like this in the sample. Okay. Um, 
Now here's another interesting question. What about bilinguals? Uh, so for another uh, set of metaphors, uh, rather than asking, is time horizontal or vertical, now let's ask, what's moving? Are you moving in time, or is time coming towards you? So in English, both of these things are very, both of these metaphors are available. You can say we're approaching the holidays, or you can say the holidays are approaching. And uh, I'll will skip the the full story that shows that people actually think of those two scenarios as being very different, even though it's against the laws of physics uh, to think of them as very different. Because in time, it shouldn't. There is no fixed ground against which you're moving, so that those two things shouldn't be different. But we treat time as if it were space, as if it had this extra dimensionality to it. Um, but nonetheless, so English speakers uh, use both of these metaphors quite frequently. In Mandarin, uh, most of the time, people talk about time as moving. Much more rarely do people talk about themselves as moving uh, in time. Um, and what we find is that, uh, so here, this is a, an abstracted graph over many studies. Um, what we find is that Mandarin speakers, uh, what I'm showing up is here, up is more likely to think of time as moving. Mandarin monolinguals are more likely to think of time as moving than English monolinguals. But look at the groups of bilinguals in the middle. So the Mandarin English bilinguals who were tested in Mandarin uh, look more like Mandarin speakers than the ones that are tested in English. So that shows you that the language that you're being tested in matters. So that gets at that bilingual question. If you're bilingual and you're thinking for one language or another, does that make a difference? The answer is yes. But uh, look, neither of those two groups are actually looking like the monolinguals of either language. Right? And what that suggests is that um, the bilinguals, the ones that are tested in Mandarin, they're being affected by having learned English, even though they're not speaking English at the time. And the bilinguals that are tested in English, they're being affected by having learned Mandarin, even though they're not uh, speaking Mandarin in the moment. So there's both this long-term effect of having learned a language, that it's affecting you even when you're not using that language, but also this immediate effect of switching between two languages, where depending on which language you're speaking, you're going to think a little bit differently. That's kind of a cool uh, way to test it. And here is just another example. This is an example from the Ayamara uh, in South America. In Ayamara, so in English, the future is ahead of us, right? All the best is ahead of us, the worst is behind us, we're looking forward to the next year, and so on. In Ayamara, the future is behind, and the past is in front. And uh, in this wonderful study, uh, Eve Switzer and Rafael Nunez looked at how people gesture when they talk about time. And the Ayamara, when they're talking about the past, they gesture towards the front. And when they talk about the future, they gesture towards the back. Uh, cool reversal. OK. So I think in that domain of time, you've seen some pretty big differences in how people think. Time can completely reverse direction. It can acquire an extra dimension. It can go from east to west as opposed to from left to right. Uh, those are some pretty big uh, differences. OK. Are there differences in real world with real world consequences? Now, of course, in the in the real world, people really care about what things are called, and the way you know that is that people are constantly arguing about what things should be called, and they're constantly trying to n change the names of things. Right? If that didn't, if people didn't think that what things were called mattered, you would never have that kind of behavior. Uh, and there's some pretty striking examples, right? Do you call someone anti-abortion or pro-life? Uh, do you call uh, a government structure a regime or an administration? Um, do we call people freedom fighters or insurgents or terrorists? Those are taking very different perspectives. Uh, does the US government sponsor torture or is it just enhanced interrogation techniques? Again, very serious consequences. Uh, uh, is, the, is it a government rescue plan or is it a bailout? Turns out many more people support the same program if you call it a rescue plan than if you call it a bailout. Um, or an older example, did Bill and Monica have sex? Uh, the case for impeachment uh, stemmed on kind of the definition of this word in English. That's a pretty serious consequence. Um, here's a, uh, a sillier example, but one, uh, I think one that rings true. Uh, at some point, uh, maybe 10 years ago, the Prune Board, the California Prune Board, petitioned the FDA to allow them to change the name of their product from prunes to dried plums. Now, uh, just to be clear, prunes and dried plums are the same thing. 
just in case you're uh, unaware. Um, now, why would they want to do that? Obviously, it's a good idea because prunes, the word prune, they live in a terrible linguistic neighborhood, right? What are prunes neighbors with? Old age, laxatives, right? They're, they remind you of all kinds of things that young, healthy Californians may not want to be reminded of when they are shopping for snacks, whereas dried plums live in a perfectly lovely linguistic neighborhood. Their neighbors are dried apricots and dried mangoes and uh, dried kiwi fruits, all kinds of tasty things, things you could take on a hike, right? Um, so they, they figured that it would be the case that young Californians would be more interested in buying uh, dried plums than they were interested in buying prunes. So they, it cost them millions of dollars to get, uh, get this change approved, and it paid off. Dried plums do sell better than prunes. Um, eventually, they had to uh, sell prunes and dried plums side by side because some people actually wanted the laxative properties of prunes, <laughs> whereas others wanted the healthy, delicious snack of dried plums. Um, and of course, anyone who's traveled knows that there are bizarrely named products being sold around the world. Uh, so for example, uh, Pakari Sweat is a very popular soft drink sold uh, all around Asia. Um, the buyers there aren't concerned by the connotations of the word sweat in something that you drink. Uh, and there is a reason, I think you can all guess, why this drink hasn't taken off as a big seller in America, and that's because Perhaps advertisers understand that something named sweat might not taste as sweet. Um, uh, back to more serious matters. Uh, in um, events in the world, you know, language requires us to construe events in the world, and even the the, the smallest, uh, the shortest, instantaneous physical events require us to come up with some way to make sense of them. So take this example. Uh, Dick Cheney goes out hunting. He has a quail, uh, quail hunting accident. He accidentally shoots his hunting partner, um, Whittington, in the face. Uh, now, that's a, that's a split-second event, and there are many, many different ways that we could possibly construe it. So this is one. Uh, this is from the European Herald, and they said, Cheney bags lawyer. So Cheney went out hunting for lawyers, and he got one. <laughs> now, um, you could say, straightforwardly, Cher Cheney shot Harry Whittington. You could say, Harry Whittington got shot by Cheney. You could say, uh, Harry Whittington got shot. Leave out Cheney altogether. It, you don't need to mention him. Uh, here's what Cheney said. Uh, this is when he was taking full responsibility for the event. He said, um, well, ultimately, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. <laughs> and you can talk about the other conditions that existed at the time, but that's the bottom line. And there's no, it was not Harry's fault. <laughs> but look at, it's very kind of him, right? Um, but look at that first sentence. Ultimately, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry. It's a split second event. But now they're four, actually, it's a chain of four events, and he just happens to be on one end of those events. <laughs> uh, Bush actually did one better. Look what he d said. He said, he heard a bird flush, and he turned and pulled the trigger and saw his friend get wounded. <laughs> that is a masterful exculpation. Cheney transforms from agent to mere witness within one sentence. Uh, of course, The Onion always has the best headlines. They say, White House had prior knowledge of Cheney threat. <laughs> August briefing warned Cheney determined to shoot old man in the face. What these descriptions differ on is how much agentivity, uh, how much causal power does Cheney have in the event? Do we describe him as the person who uh, caused the outcome, or was he just one end of a long chain of events that created the outcome? Was he even uh, at all involved? And languages give us many, many tools to construe events. Every event needs to be construed in some way. So in English, you could say, John broke the vase, or the vase broke. Uh, I'm going to call uh, this kind of construction agentive and the other not agentive. Now, uh, in Spanish, for example, you can also say something like John broke the vase or the vase broke. But in English, it's uh, this kind of construction 
the John broke the vase, the agentive construction that's more canonical. Um, when you use non-agentive language, it sounds evasive. It's the sort of thing that politicians do or young kids do uh, when they're trying to uh, get out of having done something. So, you know, mistakes were made. All of us have uh, favorite non-agentive uh, usages that we've seen in politicians. Whereas in Spanish, it's the non-agentive construction that's more canonical. That if it was a, if something was an accident, you wouldn't say he broke the vase. You would say the vase broke. You would use this clitic say here uh, to mark it. And um, there's this uh, old joke. Uh, uh, comedi uh, an American comedian in Mexico says, "Oh, uh, nothing in this country is ever anybody's fault. It's all say's fault, because you know whenever whenever something goes wrong, it's say something or other. Say did it." Um, now, this property of Spanish actually is quite common in the world's languages, and English uh, seems to be kind of an outlier in terms of how agentive we want our descriptions to be. So in English, you can even say things like, I broke my arm. Now, lo lots of languages, you can't say something like, I broke my arm, unless you're crazy, right? <laughs> unless you specifically went out looking to break your arm, and then you broke it, right? Um, it just, that would just be a really bizarre thing to say. So, do these kinds of differences in how languages tend to describe events actually matter for, for example, how people assign blame or how they punish uh, the agents of events, or maybe uh, even for eyewitness memory? Um, well, here's an example. I'm sorry that's so uh, dark. I'll narrate. Um, uh, we showed people videos, uh, and the videos either contained intentional actions or accidental actions. So here is someone popping a balloon intentionally. Okay, maybe you were able to see that. Uh, and here, uh, the same action, also popping a balloon, but this time it's an accident. Okay, so he uh, happens to move his arm, recoils in surprise. Uh, first, we wanted to find out, do English and Spanish speakers actually describe these events uh, differently? So uh, here's what English speakers said about the accidents. They said, um, a guy broke his pencil while trying to write with it. Uh, he put his hand down and picked up a sticky note, or he lost a balloon. Uh, I like this one. A man opens an automatically opening umbrella. Well, the umbrella is already automatically opening. Why does someone have to open it? Uh, but in English, someone has to open even an automatically opening umbrella. Uh, or, or they made personality attributions. The klutzy guy knocked a box off a table. In Spanish, the cases looked quite different. So uh, people said things like, an egg that fell on him broke on him, or the pencil broke, or he was going to put something away and the drawer closed itself, the paper stayed itself stuck to his hand, some keys threw themselves, um, <laughs> or out of nowhere, a pencil split itself in two. <laughs> it's not the sort of thing that ever happens in English. Uh, so uh, here's just showing you the differences in descriptions in graph form. For intentional actions, everyone describes uh, the events agentively, but for accidental actions, there's a difference. English speakers are producing more agentive descriptions than our Spanish speakers. So uh, what about in memory? Do people, if you're not describing who did it, um, if you're not paying attention to who did it, maybe you also don't remember who did it. Maybe that wasn't an important part of the event to um, pay attention to. So uh, we showed people now a third, so at, at some point in the task, people might have seen these two guys performing different actions. Uh, now we introduce a third character, and he does the action, in this case, popping the balloon. There he goes. And we ask, which of these guys did it the first time? So it's kind of like a lineup. You just have to say, can you, can you remember who done it? And here's what we find. For intentional actions, everyone remembers who did it pretty well. But for accidental actions, well, English speakers still remember who did it really well. Uh, whereas Spanish speakers remember less well. That's a less important thing to pay attention to when it's an accident. Importantly, it's very specific to the, kind, to the kinds of descriptions that you would produce for that event. But very important uh, potential consequences, right? And this is just a replication in Japanese, you can skip. Um, let me give you another example. Um, does it matter for how much we blame or punish people? Um, in one study, we looked at a whole bunch of court cases, so about 200,000 court cases uh, heard in London's central court, and we asked a simple question. If your trial contains uh, an agentive expression like broke it, 
are you more likely to be found guilty than if your trial contains a non-agentive expression like it broke? And the answer is yes. Right? Uh, if, if there's agentive language in, your, in the transcript of your uh, uh, court case, you're going to be more likely to be found guilty. We also wanted to find out uh, how much does it matter? How much do the linguistic descriptions actually matter? So what we did was we showed people uh, Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction. Uh, so I've, you guys probably, I won't show it now because I don't want to upset the censors. Um, but this was an event where Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson were performing at the Super Bowl halftime, and for 9 sixteenths of a second, Janet Jackson's breast was uh, sort of displayed on uh, national television. It was a big deal. And uh, Justin Timberlake actually coined the term wardrobe malfunction as part of his apology. That term didn't exist uh, until uh, he apologized for the wardrobe malfunction. Uh, and now people are having wardrobe malfunctions all the time. Um, so we showed people the video, they saw the video, and we gave them either an agentively phrased uh, news report about it or a non-agentively phrased news report. And they were actually the identical report except for a couple of transitive constructions in there. So and the question is, how much extra do you have to pay for a transitive? Right? So if you, get a, if, you got a, if you got nailed with a transitive construction, how much will that cost you? Well, in Justin Timberlake's case, people wanted 53% more in fines if uh, we said he ripped the costume as opposed to the costume ripped. That's a pretty hefty fine for a simple transitive. Okay, so this is where we've been. Um, let me just review some of the reasons that I think the examples I'm showing you are really about language. So you could ask, is it really that language shapes thought, or is it the other way around? Maybe people uh, who live in different places think differently, and because of that, they talk differently. How do you know which way the direction of causality goes? Well, here are some ways that we've uh, tried to find that out. One has been in language training studies. So the idea is this. If language really shapes thought, then you should be able to teach people a new way of talking, and that should change the way they think. Right? And that's exactly what uh, these studies have done, and that's exactly what you find. You teach people a new way of talking, and that inadvertently also changes the way they think. Another is in language priming studies. So uh, in the case of uh, eyewitness memory, for example, what if you took English speakers and you just bombarded them with not agentive language, so you kept saying things like, the toast burned, and the necklace unfastened, and the paint splattered, and then they had to remember a bunch of actions would they actually be worse at remembering who did it after hearing that kind of non-agentive language? The answer is yes, that if you're surrounded uh, in the, even within an experiment with non-agentive language, that changes what you pay attention to. Another one is verbal interference studies. So I talked about this at the very beginning of the talk in the case of color. Um, if you wipe out people's ability to use language in, uh, in the task, that often changes uh, how they think, that often changes what they can do. It actually makes us quite stupid to not be able to use uh, language. We don't realize that we're solving a lot of tasks linguistically, but that's what we're doing. Um, and uh, there are lots of studies showing that if you wipe out language in the moment, that really changes what we're capable of. And a final case is bilingual studies. So you take bilinguals and you test them in one language or another to see if the linguistic context, that the immediate linguistic context makes a difference. And uh, you saw an example of that, that it, it matters whether you're tested in one language or another. Um, and the other way uh, to find out is to compare bilinguals to monolinguals and see if having learned another language at some point in your past uh, makes a difference. And uh, the answer to that is also yes. So these are some of the ways to establish that causality, that language actually ha plays a causal role. It is, of course, the case that uh, the influence also goes the other way. Languages are tools that we create for our purposes, right? They're tools that suit our cognitive needs. So it isn't just that language shapes thought. It's also that differences in thought create differences in language. It goes both ways. OK, so some things we've learned. People who speak different languages think differently. There are many different aspects of language that can shape uh, thinking, from grammar and lexical differences, even to orthography, how language is written. Language medals and even low-level perceptual decisions, this was quite surprising to me. Um, 
Learning new languages can change the way you think. We see this in the bilingual studies. Uh, people who've learned another language aren't just learning a new way of expressing their thoughts. They're inadvertently actually changing what thoughts they wish to express based on, uh, based on the languages that they're learning. Uh, sometimes people do think differently depending on the language that they're being tested in. Uh, in bilinguals, both languages or however many languages you know are active to some extent when you're thinking, even when you're not using that language. So there's a long-term effect of having learned a language. Uh, one example I didn't get to show you is that learning a new language can even change the way you speak your native language. So we saw this with Indonesian English bilinguals. Uh, in Indonesian, you don't have to um, mark tense or aspect. You don't have to put temporal information in, in sentences if you don't want to. It's optional. But Indonesians who've learned English, English requires this, it enforces it in every sentence. Uh, Indonesians who've learned English start putting more temporal information in, in, in their Indonesian. So they're actually changing the way they speak their native language based on this other language that they've learned. And finally, each language provides us with its own cognitive toolkit. Um, it encapsulates the knowledge and worldview uh, that's been developed over thousands of years in a culture. Uh, an incredibly rich knowledge system that lives within each linguistic system. Okay. So, um, I hope I've shown you at least a little bit of evidence uh, suggesting that languages really shape how we construct reality and they help make us as smart and sophisticated as we are. There's one thing that I do agree with Noam Chomsky on. Uh, he says, when we study human language, we're approaching what some might call the human essence the distinctive qualities of mind that are, so far as we know, unique to man. Um, what I'd like to suggest is that if we take this idea that languages really differ from one another seriously, then each of those languages is creating a somewhat different human essence, a somewhat different way of being human, a somewhat different way of seeing the world and engaging with the world. Um, and that could be a potentially very exciting uh, insight. Now, you might think, uh, okay, uh, language profoundly, fun you're telling us it profoundly fundamentally shapes how we think, but sometimes uh, it just doesn't seem to work. Um, so here's an example. Um, people try to change, uh, to affect some linguistic change, and it's just silly, right? So here, US Congress decides to uh, rename French fries into freedom fries. This is when France refused to go into the war in Iraq uh, didn't want to join our coalition of the willing, and so this was their way of getting back at them, right? Um, well, uh, and that, that seems stupid, right? I, but this is not new. So during World War I, for example, everything that had a German-sounding name uh, became Liberty something or other. Uh, there's a reason that these kinds of substitutions don't work, and it's because they're based on a wrong theory about how cognition and language relate to one another. So uh, words that you can simply replace one for the other in a language are synonyms, right? So if two words can uh, equally go well into any phrase, that means they're, they have the same meaning, they're synonyms. And so when you make that kind of replacement, what you're saying is French is synonymous with freedom, right? So French fries are freedom fries, French toast is freedom toast, French poodles are freedom poodles, French kissing is freedom kissing, and then you have freedom manicures. But what should we call France then? Freedom land, uh, and French would be the language of freedom. Right? It's setting up the wrong kind of mapping. So what I want to suggest is if we understand really uh, how language and thought interact in the mind, we can even be nationalistic in a more effective manner. Uh, so if we really want to annoy the French, I say take all the things that the French hate and call them French. That will really annoy them. For example, ketchup becomes French sauce. McDonald's will be the French cafe, shorts will be French pants, mimosas will be French cocktails, Disneyland will be France, Americans will be French people, the English language will be called French, and so on. That'll get them. Thanks very much, and uh, these are the folks in my lab who have helped make this all possible and are funding sources that also very much help. Thank you. Bring your water.
Um, let's see. Let's put you here. Okay. I'm very excited for your questions because I've heard my talk before, so this is the new part <laughs> for me. Well, I've got a quick question. You made so much of bilingual, bilingual, whatever the word mm -hmm. is for being bilingual. Bilingualism. Uh, ooh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a belief system. Yes. <laughs> a religion, possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, um, you learned Russian first as a child, mm -hmm. and then English when you were how old? Twelve. Okay, that's still pretty young. I guess the question I would have, um, people learn language a certain way when they're very young, mm -hmm. and then a different way in school or by mm -hmm. traveling as an adult. Does it matter which comes first in how they manage their bilingualness? I like the word bilingualness. Um. It's because I can't <laughs> bilinguality without mm -hmm. falling off my chair. Um. So it definitely does get harder to learn uh, new languages as you get older, uh, and this is true for a lot of different reasons. Um, that A lot of people use that as an excuse to not learn new languages, uh, but I have a different way uh, for you guys to think about it, and that is it's uh, going to be a lot easier to learn a new language now than it will be in 10 years. So you should start now <laughs> whenever you... It's, it's, ne it's not too late, it's never too late, but it's definitely a lot easier now than it ever will be in the future. Uh, so you should do it now. Um, uh, there, definitely, um, there definitely seem to be differences in uh, languages that you learn early on, languages that you, learn, that you use the most, and languages that have, you've just been using mm -hmm. are the things that have the most sway over cognition. Mm -hmm. And this is actually quite a, an old set of principles in cognition. So there are kind of mm -hmm. three three things that best predict behavior, and that's primacy, the thing you learned first, frequency, the thing you do most often, mm. and recency, the thing you were just doing. Um, and language seems to be no different from that, that the things you learned first, the things you do most frequently, and the things you were just doing are the things that hold more sway. Now you're doing some gestures as mm -hmm. you're saying that, and Eva Tomlinson has a question. Where does gesture come in? She wonders if there have been studies that look at how the use of hands emphasizes the spoken word. Does that you know, play out in these different languages and does it affect how we think and stuff like that? So speakers of different languages do gesture differently and uh, the study of gesture has just come on the scene in the last couple of decades. It's, it's, a, it's something that people didn't use to look at in language at all. And uh, uh, there's an incredibly rich source. It's impossible to talk about gesture without paying attention to your own gestures. It's, uh, I don't know how gesture researchers give talks at all. It, mu it must be very hard. Um, but one thing that's interesting about gestures is that we gesture, we of course gesture communicatively for other people. But if you've ever seen someone talk on the phone, they still gesture, right? Which means that we're also gesturing for ourselves, that it's, it's actually helping you think. And so it has both of those functions. It's not only uh, to explain something to someone else. It's also helps, it helps you retrieve a word. If you ask people to sit on their hands while they're doing lots of cognitive tasks, um, for example, even saying what words are words, um, it, they slow down. Uh, we, want, we want to be able to have, uh, to have our, our hands to gesture, if that's what you're used to doing. Well, we have a question from Holly. Holly, are you out there? You could raise your hand. Um, to take up that theme, how about languages which are primarily gestural, sign languages? Have you done any studies of um, maybe uh, spatial systems in sign languages and how they get represented in the physical th three-dimensional space? Uh, my lab hasn't done studies on sign language, but other people have, and they're very, they're very, very interesting. So there are many different sign languages in the world. And of course, sign language is spatial uh, in its nature, in that things are represented actually in space as opposed to in time, the way a spoken language is. And so, um, uh, there are all kinds of cool decisions that sign languages also have to make, uh, like uh, am I going to represent left and right with respect to myself or with respect to the addressee, things like that. Uh, and, and how does that play out? Well, different sign languages solve that problem, problem differently. And, wow, uh, well, that's huge. You, you, have to, you have to figure that out. Yeah. Um, two versions. One. A uh, version of this question is Rick Bond asks, uh, what experiment would you love to do but can't? And my version of that question would be, uh, what, ask, what questions are you asking yourself these days in this subject area? 
So uh, the experiment that everyone in psychology wants to do but can't is you get um, a desert island or a collection of desert islands and you perfectly control all the conditions on these islands and you raise different groups of children with different um, exposure to information. You know, either raise them only with exposure to German or Spanish or you raise them with information about their gender or not, or any, any question that's about the origins, is it nature or is it nurture? That's the question, that it, that's the experiment that everyone wants to do. Obviously for silly ethical reasons. <laughs> you can't just go around buying islands and raising groups of children in whichever which way you want. So uh, we have to come up with other proxies for getting at that causal story. But, um, or finding natural cases where groups, cultural groups differ and comparing them. Obviously, I don't actually want to raise children in controlled conditions on islands, just to be clear. Um, but uh, the kinds of things that I'm thinking about now are um, how we construe internal experience. I think that's the next set, of, uh, next set of really interesting issues, because internal experience, how you feel, how you think, you know, what does it mean to have an idea? When does an idea begin and when does it end? Or when you have a thought, how long does a thought last? Or mm -hmm. what does it mean to understand all of these uh, internal experiences, um, they're so important to us in how we construe ourselves um, and how we act. So and very little is known about what, how we come up with those ideas. Just that one, I think, versus I have a thought, which suggests mm -hmm. it was there before versus mm -hmm. I created it. Do you, have, do you have glimmerings on that one or different languages doing internal events differently? Well, if you have a thought, then a thought is, uh, is a noun, for one thing, right? Mm. Something that you can have. So right, it's like in other languages, it'd be male or female, it sounds like. <laughs> That's right. Or it might be a process. It might be something you do, as okay. opposed to uh, something you have. Um, it might be a property of you. Mm -hmm. It could be, I am thinking. I'm a thinking person, uh, for I example. Uh -huh. um, and there are some really interesting differences that people have found in um, property attribution. So. Um, Here's a study by one of my colleagues uh, at Stanford, Greg Walton. Um, he, he and others noticed that if you express something in, ter in terms of a, a noun category, so you say, I am a carrot eater, or I'm a chocolate lover, um, that seems more permanent than if you say, I love carrots, or I eat carrots, or yeah. I love chocolate. And so he thought, could we actually shift people on how much they think about themselves that they love carrots or chocolate just by getting them to write, I'm a carrot lover as opposed to I love carrots. So they brought people in and they told them, this is a handwriting recognition study. Just write down this phrase five times. <coughs> and so people write down this phrase. They think it's a totally arbitrary phrase. Half the people are writing, I'm a chocolate lover, and half the people are writing, I love chocolate. And the people who are writing, I'm a chocolate lover, then later report loving chocolate more and uh, wanting to buy more chocolate and eat more chocolate and uh, <laughs> wanting to eat chocolate at more times in the future, regardless of regardless of circumstances and so on. So um, these kinds of little grammatical differences can have an effect even on how you think of yourself. And so uh, languages certainly differ in how they describe uh, personalities, for example. So some languages have marvelous noun categories for personalities. Yiddish is famous for this. There's a term in Yiddish for every personality type you could imagine. And, a lot, and actually, a lot of personality terms in English are borrowed. So if you say someone's a schmuck, or they're a, a mensch, or they're a klutz, or a putz, and so on. All of these things are, you know. Um, and so the question is, is that a more permanent ascription of personality than you would have if you used an adjective or if you used a, a verb description? interesting to see whether people who speak different languages actually think personalities can change or not, depending on how they express them. I see why you study advertising a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, advertising provides some of the best examples. There are smart folks who are thinking about how you, how you actually solve that problem. Uh, people who work in advertising are never surprised that language is important for how people conceive of things. They think it's bizarre that anyone would think otherwise. Are they reading your stuff and inviting you to their conferences and things like that? I think they already know it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think they need me to tell them. Lyra, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a number of questions here. Um, people wondering about gender. They seem oddly attracted mm. to the subject of gender. Um, but here's a good one from Jeff uh, Yonker, mm -hmm. who is asking about uh, languages, whether languages have um, more systems than just dividing up the 
categories of nouns into male and female, or some languages that do male, female, and, and neuter. Um, so have you looked at um, languages that are multi-gender or have different other, other ways of construing gender? Yeah, so uh, lots of languages have the, the systems that we talked about, masculine, feminine, neuter, that's a really boring case. Uh, lots of languages have much more exciting ways of dividing up uh, nouns into gender. So some have as many as 16 genders. There might be a gender for hunting weapons or shiny things or uh, all males except canines or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are all kinds of uh, different categorizations that languages make. My, uh, but, my favorite one is uh, what I studied in college um, the Yahi language, and they have a category for uh, round, squishy things. Round, squishy things. And humans That's fall right. into that category. Right. Uh, as George Lakoff famously made one grammatical gender uh, famous, uh, there's an Aboriginal language in Australia that has a gender for um, women, fire, and dangerous things. Uh, those are one, one gender. Most people remember, uh, that's the title of his book, uh, but most people remember that title as women, fire, and other dangerous things. But in fact, that's not the case. It's just women, fire, and dangerous things just grouped together. And yet English uh, used to call hurricanes by female names. Now, you as a We've linguist and a psychologist, was, was it a, a <laughs> loss or a gain when uh, we went uh, away from just female names for hurricanes? Uh, I don't, uh, I don't care to speculate. But there are, there are streaks like that. There are streaks like that in languages. So, for example, in Hebrew, all diseases are feminine. So, when a new disease is discovered, it's always going to be feminine. Why do you think languages need these categories? Mm. Well, it, categories. Are, I mean, categories are useful. So every word is really a category, right? So, chair, a word like chair, very prosaic word. But um, there are all these different things that are chairs. They look different, they feel different, they smell different, right? And so that word, chair, is a category, and all, all the other words in any language are too. Languages, in addition to those word categories, also have these grammatical categories. Um, it, some people uh, study, for example, with grammatical gender, it's useful for um, keeping track of what's related to what in a sentence. So in a language like hmm. Russian, you might have you know, dependencies between words that are seven words apart, and it's really hard to know if uh, this adjective is modifying this noun or that noun. And if you have three grammatical genders, that ups the probability that it will be uh, not so ambiguous, that you'll be able to track what goes with what. So that's one, one useful case. But really, we just love to categorize. Humans love, love putting things in categories and organizing our world. And I mean, look at, you guys are all sitting in these organized chairs, and I've been spatially segregated from you, and you're parked in these wonderfully organized parking spots outside, and uh, our streets are organized into blocks. Every, you know, that's, that's what we do. We're wonderful organizers, and language is just is a masterful case of that, for trying to create structure in the world. Mm -hmm. Arbitrary or non-arbitrary structure? Um, some structure, I think, is arbitrary, but a lot of it isn't. Right. So. Um, are chairs and tables arbitrarily masculine or feminine? <laughs> or are they uh, masculine or feminine in languages for a particular reason? One thing that we, one way we tried to get at that question was, um, first we compared grammatical genders uh, across a whole bunch of different languages, European languages. Um, and what we found was there was a correlation for animal genders. Um, so cats are feminine, dogs are masculine. That's Everywhere? Not everywhere, it's just a correlation. Um, but for artifacts, we found no, no correlation, so it seemed pretty arbitrary. We also asked English speakers who hadn't learned uh, any grammatical gender languages to predict. We say, you know, chair, table, cat, hmm. masculine or feminine. And uh, for animals, again, they were able to predict, but for artifacts, they weren't. So uh, there seems to be a whole lot of arbitrariness. One, uh, one way to see that is to see how, language, how languages assign genders to new words that come into a language, borrowed words. So my favorite example mm. is the word giraffe. So uh, Russian and German didn't have a word for giraffe until relatively recently for obvious reasons. There weren't any giraffes to talk about. Um, and so then the French go into Africa, they see giraffes. They come back with this wonderful new word, giraffe, for this mythical creature. Uh, and the Russians and the Germans want to talk about giraffes too, so they borrow the French word giraffe. 
Now, in German, it's using the same spelling, the same alphabet system as uh, the French. There's an E at the end of the word. And so anything with an E at the end is likely to become feminine in German. So giraffe becomes a feminine word in German. Russian uses a different alphabet system, and anything with a consonant sounding ending gets uh, uh. masculine grammatical gender. So it becomes uh, a masculine <coughs> noun in Russian. So same word adopted about the same time into two different languages and assigned based on these principles of convenience. Which was it in French? I don't even know. Anybody Probably know? Feminine. Le feminine. giraffe. La giraffe. Feminine, yeah. yeah that, of course, they ballet across the <laughs> landscape, right? <laughs> uh, I got a question from Michael Lyons. Could you please speak about relative vocabularies, for example, like Eskimos having 57 words for snow, or one I feel we deal with in California. Spanish is a really straightforward, relatively simple language in the sense of one word, one thing. And English seems to be just full of all kinds of workarounds. And uh, if I was going to have Alzheimer's, I'd rather have it in English than in Spanish, because you can always figure out something that's sort of like what you're trying to say. Well, so languages do grow vocabularies when um when a language is spoken in lots of different locations, when uh, a language is written down, when um, lots of different professions speak the same language, that's when languages end up with bigger and bigger vocabularies. Hmm. So you can, you can use those factors to predict how big a vocabulary a language is going to have. Um, Spanish is a very rich language. Okay, I would, I sorry, have, I, you I frowned when I said it was simple. Okay. I wouldn't have characterized it that way. Um, but um, in... In all cases where we acquire expertise, we also acquire vocabulary, right? So um, mm. even in, we were talking about left and right, and do we do it with respect to the speaker or the addressee? Um, in some cases, you just have to know. So for example, if you're a sailor, you don't use left and right on a boat, you use port and starboard. Mm -hmm. Because if you have to say, oh wait, your right or my right, it might be too late, right? So you want to avoid any kind of ambiguity like that, so you develop new, new vocabulary to solve that problem. Aboriginal sailors would use the cardinal points. Yes, they would. Mm -hmm. And sailors also, you know, they, they orient usually with respect to the wind. So uh, nope. the wind direction is the thing that sets uh, a lot of things. By the but, way. Um, so that, that's the kind of, Richness, there's a co-development co of you develop vocabulary for things that you want to talk about or things you want to think about in more fine detail. Uh, but also, once that vocabulary is developed, if you're a child born into a language that has that vocabulary, you have to learn it. You have to learn those distinctions. And so it, there's kind of this reciprocal set of relationships. People develop more vocabulary, then uh, the next group of folks who learn the language have to learn those distinctions, and the next... Uh, the next group uh, may even refine the vocabulary and so on. But it doesn't go to infinity. It, it seems like <clears throat> different cultures have a kind of a, th that's enough words, thanks, uh, limit. Or is that not the case? Well, I don't know. We know a lot of words. How many? Well, I don't know how many you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> Nor I. But, but there's probably some number of English, you know, the sort of a college educated English person will have X number of words. Um, there, there are numbers like that. I, I don't think actually numbers of words are that meaningful to count because okay. in, um, in lots of languages there's even this question of what, what counts as a word. So if you speak an agglutinative language and you can mm. put lots of different pieces together, um, you can create a, what would be a word that's like you know, the Eskimo example. You can say snow that's been peed on. You know, that's a new word because you can put all those bits together and it's a... 58 it's, words it's a, for snow they have. Well, that's, that's a really important category. Don't boil that snow. There, there aren't 58 <laughs> words, but I think it raises a really... The, the case of Eskimo snow words, I think, raises a very interesting question of what you count as a word and what makes us uh, say that one language has a word for anything. So how many words for snow does English have? Does it have one word, snow? Or do we also count uh, slush and sleet and powder and freshy? And, uh, skiers have more words for snow. Skiers have a lot of words for snow, yeah, mm -hmm. many different categories. So I have a question about um, vocabulary and categories. Um, this is, this is uh, prompted by a question by Aaron Mills. Um, who is asking whether the, um, the orientation to cardinal directions that you, that you saw among Australian Aboriginal, mm -hmm. some Australian Aboriginal languages, 
Do you think, or do you have any evidence that that might, we know that a lot of these languages are, are rapidly disappearing because people are shifting to dominant languages there, I guess, mm -hmm. English. Um, so the idea is, do these categorizations survive a shift to another language? It's, a, it's an interesting question. So what I saw in Pomparao, in this community, uh, people, a lot of people there speak English. Um, but um, the whole time I was there, I only ever heard one use of the word right and never a left. And so when people are giving directions in English in Pomparao, um, instead of using left and right, they also don't use north, south, east, and west. But what they do instead is they point to the correct direction. And uh, gesturing in general in correct directions is very important. People do this all the time. So someone says, oh, what are you doing today? You might say, oh, I'm going to Melbourne. And uh, they might say, oh, Melbourne. And they point in a direction of Melbourne, even though it might be 2,000 miles away. But that's an important part of the communication. When I first got there, this is something I had, I, this is a, a really hard problem I had to solve. I wasn't prepared for, which was people ask, where are you from? And uh, it was somewhat unusual in there because I was speaking with an American accent and that's the way the television speaks. So it wasn't clear if I had come from the television or what, uh, <laughs> where, where I'd arrived from. Uh, but people would say, I, I would say I'm from California, but that's insufficient. You have to point in the direction from which you've come. And so I had, uh, exactly, well, I had this problem. Which way do you point to California from uh, Cape York? Do you go around the way <laughs> my flight went? Or do you want go the, you know, as the bird, as the crow flies? Or do you go through the earth? And so the first few times I was asked this question and I was required to point, I, I pointed inconsistently. And I think people thought it was quite a shifty character um, <laughs> because I was clearly trying to hide from them where it was that I, either, either I didn't know, which would be very weird, or uh, I was actually uh, not being straight with them. And so it took a little while for me to settle on a, on a simple simple way of pointing. So do you think this, this use of gesture is kind of an interim strategy? I and mean, what do you think um, their children would do? Do you think that they would retain those gestures? Or do you think that they would maybe adopt the English system altogether? Or, I mean, do you see that as a stage of, of language and cultural shift? Or do you think that those yeah, hang on for a while? It's hard to predict. I mean, there are lots of things that we do in gesture that we don't do in language. So for example, in English, English speakers will gesture from left to right for time. So you say, first we did this, then we did this, then we did that. But we never say, Tuesday is left of Wednesday, or you know, I still have lots of things to do left of the party, or things. So we don't use terms left and right to talk about time. But yet in gesture, that's the pattern that we have. So it's conceivable that a pattern could be very strong in, ge in gesture, but not exist in, in the language. And mm. that would be a way that it perseveres in the culture. Mm. As long as something else keeps it alive. I've got <clears throat> a couple of limitation questions. Um, Jeremy Faludi says, clearly language shapes thought, but what overrules language? For example, Hungarian has no gender and pronouns, but Hungarians are just as sexist as anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> Jason, you're nodding your head. Uh, Jason Asbar says, do you have any examples of thoughts or experiences that cannot be expressed? In language, and so, in, in a sense, we're, we're looking for what's the horizon of this continent that mm -hmm. you're exploring. So, um, clearly, there are lots of uh, there's lots of structure in the world that we can discover, even if uh, language doesn't hold those categories. So, um, the case of Hungarian or Finnish languages that don't have gender, um, you know, it isn't the case that. Finnish speakers are only able to reproduce by randomly bumping into each other. Um, <laughs> once in a while, an accident occurs and a new Finnish speaker is born, right? Uh, they've clearly figured out that there are these two biological genders, right? Even though that's not in the language. But um, even in cases like that, uh, if you look at kids acquiring uh, these languages, um, this is a study by Alexander Giora. He, he did this study in the 80s. I, I love this study. He asked um, kids who are learning Finnish, English, and Hebrew the same question. He asked them, are you a boy or a girl at different ages? Now, this is something kids have to figure out. Um, and he had all kinds of clever ways of asking this that didn't require uh, using the terms boy and girl in language. So he would have uh, piles of pictures of boys and girls, and he would uh, you know, take all the girls and put them in one pile, and all the boys and put them in another pile. And then he would take a Polaroid of the kid and say, and here's, here's your picture. What pile do you go in? And so on. What he found was 
uh, Hebrew is a very, very highly gendered language. Even the word for you is gendered. Mm -hmm. English is kind of an intermediate case, and then Finnish has no gender marking. So what he finds is the Hebrew kids get it first. They discover first whether they themselves are a boy or a girl, and then the English kids, and then the Finnish kids. Now, eventually, they all figure it out, more or less, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, there, is, there is this developmental difference that it takes you longer to discover a category if it's, uh, if it's not available in your language. So I think that's, that, that's kind of a, a lovely example of how language can change the developmental timeline. For things that are not expressible in language, there are lots of things. Language is uh, really bad for any kind of spatial uh, thing. So if you've ever been um, at a cake shop uh, and you want that one, no, no, that one over there, you keep pointing, it's very, very hard to specify exactly which one you want. Um, Aborigines would be cool with that. They just said <laughs> a foot to the southeast. That's right. Um, but there are also lots of uh, qualia-like experiences that are hard to express in language. So um, Wittgenstein had this wonderful example. He says you can, it's very easy to express uh, the height of Mount Kilimanjaro in language, but it's very hard to express the sound that a clarinet makes in language. How would you describe the sound of a clarinet? That's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And so there's some kinds of things that seem to be much more suitable for linguistic framing than other kinds but we have other ways of representing those. We do indeed. One more question from you and one from me, and I think we'll call it a night. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the uh, prerogative of sitting in this chair and interject my own question. Um, so this is a follow-up sort of to the question about what experiment would you love to do but you can't do? And this is going back to John Brockman's Ed question of 2006. What do you believe that you cannot prove? Because you've proven quite a or at least tried to prove or experimented on a number of different things. But what do you believe about human language that you cannot prove? Well, uh, I think what I would like to see, oh my goodness. Um, what's very hard to capture in any one experiment is uh, the set of relationships uh, between all the different subsystems of a language. So it's one thing to go in and say, well, the spatial system is like this, and the temporal system is like this, and the gender system is like this. But all of these things are actually working together in any actual natural speaker of a language. They are using all of these things. And so what I would really love to be able to do is actually start putting those pieces together. And my sense is um, that when you're not looking at just one, one little bit at a time, but when you're actually putting a whole system together, uh, much more complex differences emerge uh, that we right now can't measure yet. But um, it'll be really exciting to see what it will take to be able to measure those uh, system level differences as opposed to individual experimental example differences. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but mm. uh, we're gonna try. Quick follow-up question. Do you see the field of linguistics moving in that direction? Um, a lot of linguistics has turned experimental in the last 10 years, um, and also a lot of linguistics has turned computational in the last 10 years, and that's really exciting because it is, um, it's just becoming a much more empirical discipline, and I think partially it's that the technology is improving and our understanding of uh, linguistic differences is improving, and so um, if you have data to mine and you know how to mine the data, that it, it, it opens up all kinds of questions you couldn't ask before. My question um, relates to how, as a scientist, you sort of blend and manage your curiosity and your performance um, apparatus. And uh, so I guess I would ask you, you've gone to Burning Man several times, mm -hmm. I gather. And how did your curiosity and performance uh, aspects play out in going to Burning Man and what happened there? Well, it's, uh, I, taught, I alluded earlier to learning another language is like exploring another world, and mm. finding a new way of, of, of seeing, seeing the world. Of course, another way of exploring another world is to go to another world. Um, and so uh, you can think of uh, you know, going to another country or uh, going even to, um, you don't have to go to another country. You could go to a neighborhood that's of a different socioeconomic status than you mm -hmm. live in and see, uh, see a totally different world. And I, I think Burning Man has that same flavor of experience for a lot of people where they feel like they travel to a world that has a different set of social rules and a different set of aesthetic 
uh, criteria that are selected. So. When you go to North Australia or to Indonesia, okay. you don't usually drive a car shaped like a banana. Um, so say a little about <laughs> your performance aspects of, of Burning Man. You know, what, what was that about? Um, it was it was really just for fun. So uh, in uh, many years ago, when I was uh, this tall, um, uh, uh, some friends and I built this giant banana vehicle. That it was meant to be a Trojan banana. So you would uh, we would all climb inside and we would go and, in, and invade another camp. And uh, no one would refu the banana was such an attractive thing. It would, it, no one would refuse a giant yellow glowing banana in their camp. But then we would all jump out and attempt to steal their beer. So. I, I feel very confident about the future of science. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.